Hello, it's great to be finally bringing archives to your town. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Let's talk about archives on tour. Hello, Wagga Wagga. It's fabulous to be with you, at least virtually. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. Particular welcome to Wayne and Gillian from the Charles Sturt University Regional Archives, which is one of our regional archive centres. This is how we got here. One of New South Wales archive strategies is to engage across the state through our regional network and touring exhibitions. And archives on your tour is another way for us to really focus in on regional New South Wales. Archives on tour began in 2018-2019 when we took the 1828 census on tour to celebrate its inscription on the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Register. So for 2019-20, we decided to take parts of six of the big series of archives that cover the whole state to six different towns across New South Wales. We all know what happened then. COVID disrupted many, many plans, including archives in your town and probably far more important plans as well, as great as archives in your town is. This is what we thought is that at the heart of every town are people and buildings. And we know that our collection contains archives about people and buildings of towns all across the state of New South Wales. And those archives have got a huge range of subjects and perspectives. So we're virtually bringing you archives from the people and buildings of Wagga Wagga. We'll talk about the series of archives and how you can find them on our website and how to access the archives. It's time for you, as Emily said, to share your memories and knowledge out of the literally, and I mean literally millions of archives, we've picked just a few to show. Archives in your town has its own pages on our website, so you can browse the digital versions of the archives. We talk about it at your own pace later. Um, and you'll be able to find it through archives slash magazine slash your town, but at the moment there's a shortcut on our homepage. I looked at this slide and I thought I should probably have titled it, Where Have We Been? So we started in Tamworth, did the kind of west double broken hills headed for the coast and now was circled back into the southwest with Wagga Wagga. We'd worked with the staff from the Charles Sturt Universal Regional Archives right from the beginning and I want to thank them for being so willing to be involved. They've suggested some of the people and buildings and provided some background information. We're taping the whole webinar for future use but we won't use your comments and questions. These are the series that we'll be looking at today. We'll pause after the building, so after the hotel plans. Oh, theatres and public halls files possibly. Um, so have your memories and questions ready. But we'll start with the school files. So we're in our S3829 school files, cover a huge, huge slab of history, over 100 years, 1878 to 1979. They were created by bringing together all of the correspondence about each school and the correspondence is from everyone. Teachers, parents, the education department and district officers, other government departments, local members and education ministers. The later files from about 1940 onwards don't contain as much detailed information, particularly about teachers and are also much more official in tone. Apart from everything else that you can see on that slide, they really show you how the schools worked over that broad time period and how the schools interacted with the communities. So Emily is going to take you behind the scenes in the State Archives. So in this file on Durambar School, we start with the application and there's actually an inspector's report talking about the establishment of the school, explaining where Durambar is. So it's on the Tweed River, talking about it being a, for, a farming community, good land and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, people listed in the local community who would promote the local school. Uh, we've got a list of how many students might, might be expected to attend. We've got a map of the school district and where the residents who have children might be living.
a lot of correspondence about teachers. They almost feel a little bit like a personnel file when these things didn't exist. Um, here for this teacher, William Tashihi, we've actually got a list of his previous employment and comments to do with his promotions and things like that from 1896 back to 1889. We've got a list of families, number of children who were supposed to attend the school and why they weren't attending often due to the weather or being ill or one because they had a sore foot. Here from 1897, we have um, William Sheehy resigning this time due to his charge of obscene language in the local billiard room and the inquiry that ensued. Correspondence to do with the school site. So talking in 1901 about dedicating two acres as a site for the public school. There's a copy of the portion plan, the crown plan, and there's the two acres that they're going to dedicate for this school. So the files are listed in our online schools and related records index. They're just called administrative files and they cover those years 1876 to 1939, 1940 to 1979. You can also pick them up through the catalogue so you can pre-order them for the reading room. Because of their varying size, we don't offer them through the copy order service, but it is something you need to come into the reading room to have a look at. And because there's so much material about teachers and other, other aspects of the school, they work really nicely in hand with the teacher's career cards and the teacher's roles. They work nicely with the school photographs and they also work together with our admission registers, punishment books, and the other resources that we've got from some public schools in New South Wales. So only public schools. Um, but well worth a look if you're researching the history of a local community because so often the school is the community and the community is the school. So these are the schools we're going to briefly talk about. Wagga Wagga Public School, Lake Albert Public School, Wagga Wagga North, Wagga Wagga South, the High School and the two Karingal schools. All of these schools are still open and there are many more schools in Wagga now, of course. The similarities between all of the school files, they reflect their times, both World Wars, but particularly World War I, the fact that women having had to resign if they married, the depressions, the expanding and decreasing populations, but they also reflect their town. As Wagga grows in population and area, so does the need for schools. And you can see the different areas that grow reflected really clearly in the school files and those that are starting to perhaps not have as many children in them. There are also problems with the locations of some of the schools in Wagga. Some of the school files are up to 15 boxes of papers and some are only a couple of centimetres thick. The file for Wagga Wagga Public School is over a metre of paper. So I've selected a very small quantity of papers from each of these schools. They've been digitised and put on the Wagga Wagga Archives in Your Town page. And we're just going to look at a small selection of those pages now. The Wagga Wagga Public School started in 1861. In the late 1870s and into the early 1880s, and I don't have an explanation for this, there was very intense scrutiny of attendance and discussion of staffing, particularly in the girls' department of the school. So you can see on the left that they're looking at attendance and the numbers, and there's always a big disparity, I find, between those enrolled and those attending. And then down on the left, the inspector who's bringing a bit of common sense to the discussion is that in 1879, there was a flood and the children of North Wagga were cut off from their school for about six weeks. And that would explain some of the um, reduction in attendance. So again, this table, which is a great thing to have, it tells you a lot about the school, shows quarterly attendance and the school fillies across three and a bit years. And then quite unusually lists the staff at the bottom of the page. 
So it's probably no surprise that there are more boys attending than girls throughout the time. And you'll see that in 1879, they had enough students to start a separate infants department. In 1880, the Department of Education brought in a concept called the Evening Public Schools. They were designed to provide an elementary education for persons over 14 years of age who'd previously received little to no education. They offered young men, very few females ever enrolled, they were allowed to, two hours of instruction three nights a week usually conducted in the local public school by the headmaster or other teachers. Most of the schools were poorly attended and short-lived. So this is the list of people who have put their hands up or perhaps their fathers have put their hands up to say that they'll attend an evening public school at Wagga Wagga. So you can see that Leslie Grant Ogilvy is 15 years old. He's an assistant in a stationery and tobacconist shop and signed by both of his parents. Um, George Hyunsich is 15 and is a bookkeeper. Then there's, I think it's Hong Ching, who's 29 and he's the manager of a store. Obviously, in his, his parents are not signing, so someone who's looking to have further education. And again, I think Edward Spring, same, hasn't added an age and is a hotel keeper and has just signed for himself. But it does give you for Wagga this list of people of that age that are interested with that detail about them, which is just great. So this is a little plan from 1882 of the Wagga public school site. So Gurwood Street, Simmons Street and Johnson Street. Um, you can see the separation throughout boys schools, girls schools and the different sheds. So the area in red at the top is the proposed changes. Um, basically a boy, new boys school, so that the girls could expand into what was the old boys area. There's nothing very clear from the school file whether these additions went ahead or not. So this is a letter from uh, Alfred Bennett. He appeared on that staff list at Wagga Public School in 1882 as a pupil teacher. Here in 1885, He's returned from serving with the Sudan expedition and wishes to resume his duty as a teacher. So he literally says, I've had the honour to inform you that having returned from active service in the Sudan, I'm prepared to resume duties forthwith. Um, you'll usually find with these, there's a letter and then there's a comment and they've recommended that he can, in that time between 1882 and 85, he ceased to be a pupil teacher and was an assistant teacher. So he resumes his career there. We're moving now into the 1940s and there's just a whole range of new sorts of things happening. So on the very bright orange bit of paper, 1941, um, the Parents and Citizens Association have obviously been talking to the school about purchasing a sound film projector and the official reply from the Department of Education, that's up to them. But also pointing out there's 250 sound and silent films in the department's library and it's expected that approximately 20 more will be added very shortly. We hold that um, sound library and some of those films are films that we have digitised and are probably available through our website. So it's quite a link between that time and now. They're appointing teacher librarians, which seems like quite an early um, time for that to be happening. And they're also facing declining numbers of pupils as the population moved into different areas of Wagga. So basically what they're saying is they think that Wagga Public School isn't necessarily going to grow because the population of the town is drifting away from the sector in which this school is located and not likely to be an increase and then points out some statistics. So now we're going to have a look at Lake, Public Public, Lake Albert Public School, which started in 1868. And this is about Arbor Day. Arbor Day encouraged individuals and groups to plant trees and has been observed in Australia since 1889. So at Lake Albert, they'd set a day aside in 1890 to plant the trees and the teacher is setting out what's happening in the day that it's happening on. So they've 
dug holes two feet by two feet by two feet deep for the reception of the trees and the pupils have been helping with that. Um, they're going to have a special lecture and then after the lecture the trees will be planted and then the children will be regaled with all kinds of edibles which sounds like a typical school day or well, a special day. These are notes from a report by the Department of Public Instruction's Chief Medical Officer. All of the pupils secured by the headmaster, because he says that he's managed to secure an attendance of 45 scholars, were tested for diphtheria. So they were having quite a serious outbreak of diphtheria at this school, um, which had naturally been affecting attendance. And what they discovered is that there were three pupils who didn't exhibit symptoms of diphtheria, but were actually um, carrying it. And then in the four points listed there, ceasing to use a common towel, ceasing to use a common drinking vessels, ceasing to use the slates and pencils and everything else, sounds very similar to the sorts of lives that um, pupils are in dealing with now. This is North Wagga Wagga Public School. So it started in um, about 1878. And these extracts are from an application in 1879 for support for a provisional school at North Wagga Wagga Railway Station, which is called in brackets, Miss Smith's. So she was actually running a school. It was approved and started in 1879, becoming Bowen in 1882 before closing later in 1882. The North Wagga Proposed School, Mr. Petlands, opened in 1880 and is now Wagga North. These applications, and this is true of any school file, where there are applications of great source of information about an area. So when they're talking about the, um, the, the North Railway Station School, about 35 children may regularly attend for the next 12 months i.e. that's while the railway works are in progress. About half this number is drawn from the farms round about. So there are some, you know, people who are living there permanently. Before long, the traffic will change to South Wagga over the temporary bridge, where probably nine tenths of the stores and public houses will follow. So he's describing a whole shift in the way Wagga is working at that time. The permanent population, however, will suffice to support a small public school. And that's the school that became Wagga North. Um, the opening of this proposed provisional school will not interfere with any of the schools except Brewster, which is about four miles off. But the population between the two schools is very small anyway. And also the North Wagga proposed school goes on to say that the two schools are separated by a miles by two miles of flooded land, which I guess is the lagoon in the area, and then gives you the number of students, 56 boys and 56 girls who are likely to attend. In 1905, the teacher at North Wagga took action about the drinking water in the tank and um, did receive a bit of a rap over the knuckles for that. But Mr Stevenson was absolutely right. The water was unfit for human consumption. Um, so Mr Stevens was told to sort out a different water supply and to not directly approach the Department of Health in future. Now Wagga Wagga South. Opening a little bit earlier than this, um, in 1891, they are writing to see if the Minister for Public Instruction will come and open the new building. And from the notes on the side where it says, except for about four or five weeks hence, it seems that he did and that on top of that, he was the first Minister of Public Instruction to visit Wagga. The school at Wagga South is in a, quite a small area and in the past an even smaller area. And the need for more land is a common theme all the way through the school file about, school files about Wagga South. So in 1907, Mr Bolton, the teacher, suggested getting in early and resuming some land. So you'll see down on the map, this is the blue here between Best Street and Maclay Street. That's the school site. So his suggestion was to regime these four lots across the road. And he was right. They absolutely did need to regime um, land, 
but that road is what would become the highway. So that would have been a huge problem, I suspect, for many school teachers for many years to come. In 1944, Wagga South missed the list of urgently needed extensions, something that you'll see time and again, because there's a lot of schools across New South Wales. The information provided though does give a picture of that area. So in replying that the you know, case wasn't included on the list of urgent requirements, here's five questions for you. So were the school populations likely to remain stable after the war? Um, school populations likely to remain stable after the war, especially at Wagga South, which is in the developing residential portion of town. So that's where people are moving rather than where Wagga Public School was. Um, there would be, there's 740 students and re if the boundary line hadn't been drawn where it was, it would be over 800 and is predicting that in the next five years we'll probably reach 850. Any development in the town will affect this school most. So that's where the development was happening in that immediate post-war area. The building will depend on developments. Minimum proposed is four classrooms. So again, while it's a school file and it's about the school, the schools really reflect what is happening. So, and then there's a great little drawing of the school as it existed at that time. Walker South continued to grow and it continued to be short of space and buildings. So you'll see from the letter on the left that before 1947, the Presbyterian Hall was used as part of the school. And then from 1948, the Catholic United Charities Auxiliary Hut at the showground was used. By 1954, four classes were in the hut there. Additional space was eventually found by resuming terraces in Edward and Maclay Street. Wagga Wagga High School opened in 1912. Within two years, they were planning extensions. So you'll see on the plan on the left, the proposed school to be added to the pink areas. And it's going to add really quite a considerable number of classrooms. I'm not going to read you all of this, but do go and have a look at this. It's an extract from a report on the agriculture classes at Wagga and to an extent also at Aubrey and the response to the report. So basically one agriculture teacher was splitting his week between Aubrey and Wagga. So he talks about the sorts of things that should be included, um, apparently including a modern language in the intermediate certificate for agriculture would be really important. Part of the reasons would help to get into agriculture at university. Um, and Hawkesbury College favours that, so it must be a good idea. He then talks about what they've done. And this is just, this is farming, isn't it? The practical farm work at Wagga has, in spite of the mouse and grasshopper plagues, as also the excessive wet season, progressed very favourably. Since December 1916, when the clearing was completed, four and a half acres of cereal yields have been harvested, providing a stack of hay weighing about 10 tonnes. We expect a yield of one and a half tonnes of early potatoes. All of the fruit trees have struck and are growing vigorously. 60 grapevines, including muskets, currants and raisins, are also doing well. Um, so he's recommended that they need more laboratory equipment. Um, they need some dairy cows so they can uh, do milk testing, separation of butter milking. And basically the report is that they will go full time with agriculture at Wagga High School. Um, seems to suit the area better. And at the moment, the response at Aubrey had been poor. So they're going to recommend that that's not continued at that time. Wagga High School, which is near Wagga South, was similarly short of space. Inspector Hoskin um, recommended buying land south of the existing site. Because basically in terms of the building activities, so this is in 1944, the erection of new buildings in the near future doesn't appear practical. And from that point of view, resumption is not urgent. But in view of the needs of the school, probable future developments and the fact that the position is a favoured building site, consider that it should be taken without delay to resume the area. 
And then this great little map from 1949, which is actually from a uh, parents and citizens letter, shows you that area as a whole. So you can see the orange at the top is Wagga South, um, Mount Erin High School, which is the Catholic High School, Wagga High School, and then the Technical College. And this file also, because of its proximity to the Technical College, contains quite a bit of information about the Technical College and also the Teachers College and sort of the three of those things, the high school, tech college and teachers college, a um, bit of jockeying for space in that area, who's going to get enough space to be able to do what they need to do. So Coringal Public School had a little bit of a, a mixed start. So this is part of a survey of children in 1955 in that area, which was done by the Lake Albert Road Progress Association. This is just one of five pages, but again, fantastic information about the people in that area. So um, MJ Fool owns their house. They've been there for a year and 10 months. They've got two children, Alan David and Sandra Joan, one's eight and nine months, one is six. They're 20 chains from the proposed school site, currently at South Wagga, which is two and a quarter miles in their Church of England. So five pages of fabulous information about people and the sorts of makeup and particularly the how long they had been there. Do they own, do they lease? So you see then at the top, says Henwood Park, establishment of a school. So Henwood Park is the first name for Kringle. The inspector with the headmaster and teachers from South Walker did a child population survey in 1957. He also notes many homes are under construction and there's extensive subdivision of the land. So at this point, this looks like it's a really growing area of um, Wagga. So most of the primary school children now travel by crowded bus daily to South Wagga Wagga School. The Henwood Park School site is about two and a half miles from Wagga South, as shown by the papers on this file. They did the earlier survey in 55, that's a typo I think, when there were 94 primary school children. Two years later, that's increased to, I think it's 111. So that's quite a rapid increase. Um, again, even where he says timber building would fit in well in appearance with the type of homes being built in Henwood Park. No agitation for a palatial brick structure is anticipated from the young home builders and residents of the area. Um, nonetheless, I think they did end up with a brick building and it opened in 1959. And then naturally what needs to follow next is a high school. So planning for the Kringle High School was underway from 1970. Construction was well underway in 1972. As you can see here, construction has commenced and it's anticipated the school will operate on its new site from the first day of 19, the 1973 school year. So this, what would be the second form for Kringle High School is currently being boarded as first form is at Mount Austin High School. You can imagine how crowded Mount Austin was. Um, the operation of a high school in Kringle will have an effect on Mount Austin High School reducing that school over the next two years to the vicinity of a thousand, where currently their enrolment was 1,300. But there's still considerable development taking place at Austin, adjacent to Mount Austin High School. So they expect that it would be back up to 1,200 students within the next five years. The enrolments of Wagga High School are currently 1,100 and is expected that this school's future feed area, which will be slightly reduced because of the loss of some pupils to Kringa High School. It also talks about because of the current trend towards the sale of the older homes in the inner city area to young couples, it could well be that in future years there would be an upsurge of numbers in this school. So it's that thing of people growing up, perhaps moving to different places. And then when the school eventually was opened in 1975, it was opened by jointly the Minister for Education and the local member of Parliament, Wal Fife. But Wal Fife resigned from Parliament about a week later. So this is a letter from the private secretary to the minister to the public relations office saying, still want to have Wal Fife on the plaque, but we just need to reword how, what that says. 
So how do you find school files? Our website's www.records.nsw.gov.au. Click on online indexes in the quick links box on the home page, click on S for schools, click on schools in the list of topics, and then you scroll down to the schools and related records index. And you can just search, put in the name of the school or the town. The school files are listed as administrative files. I'm going to talk about hotel plans. So there are plans for hotels in Wagga and the surrounding area, which were submitted to the Wagga Licensing Court for approval. They've got a lot of detail, so they're architectural plans. And hotels, of course, were meeting places and provided accommodation in town for workers, visitors, commercial travellers, and pastoralists from the surrounding area. They also provided venues for auctions, um, functions, and in many ways, at times, we're completely the centre of um, town. Here's one of those plans. So JH Granlease had the architectural firm of WJ Monks, Jefferson Shaw, produce this plan for alterations to the Black Swan Hotel in North Wagga in 1926. So the blue is the existing hotel. You can see it's being extended to add a couple of bedrooms, a dining room or possibly a bigger dining room with an extended kitchen out the back. And it's a fairly simple single storey hotel. The Australian Hotel in Fitzmaurice Street in Wagga was a very different and much larger hotel with four floors. These are extracts from plans produced by DW Souter. The plans aren't dated but they might be from around 1950. And these are two possible front elevations that DW Suda was proposing to the owners. Completely different to the Black Swan, as you can see. This is a ground floor plan from the same set of plans. You can see here the public bar with that classic enclosed central bar. The restaurant, quite extensive, is a gymnasium, club room staff quarters downstairs, the driveway where you would go up to, I think this is reception if you were staying there, and there's multiple floors of accommodation above that. Now, in terms of finding these plans from NRS 9595, they're not listed on our website at the moment. So if you were looking for a particular hotel, use our Ask an Archivist form on the website. Um, I suggest these as something to get onto our website every time someone asks me for a suggestion because they're great, really great things. So similarly, the plans of public buildings, NRS 4335. We hold plans from 1837 through to the 1970s. So the plans of government buildings and those buildings have got a whole range of different purposes, as you can see. All of these buildings are often large and enduring, even if their purpose changes over time. They haven't all survived, of course. So now Emily is going to take you behind the scenes to look at these plans. And you'll see a completely different part of our storage area. of these in our collection and 438 of them have been digitised and you can find the digitised copies in collection search. The plans are of all sorts of public buildings from all over New South Wales, so things like police stations, courthouses, jails, public schools, public buildings like land offices, post offices, some of those big buildings that you might know in the city like the Registrar General's Office, the Colonial Secretary's Building and the Treasury Buildings are all included in these plans. But there are some plans that are closed to public access if they're of a security building like a jail or a police station or a courthouse that is still operating as a jail, police station or a courthouse, for example. So we do hold plans of Long Bay Jail, 
and those plans are still closed to public access because Long Bay Jail still operates as a jail. And some of those very old country police stations, as another example, where the police are still inhabiting the building, those ones would be closed. But there are a lot that are open to public access. Here are two of Wagga's plans of public buildings. This is the Wagga Wagga Watch House and it was being extended in 1887. So you can see this area here, it's quite an unusual shaped building and it's just titled New Room. Not very. You can also see there are lots of pencil notes, possibly about other changes that were going to be made in the future. This building is titled Wagga Wagga Lockup, but I'm pretty confident it's the same building. The building's from, I think, the early 1900s. Can't quite read the date, could be 1910. The plan shows that they're going to add cells and a prisoner's yard to make it somewhere they can more securely keep prisoners. So if you want to find the plans of public buildings, there's two ways to search and you should do both. Go to our website, type in NRS 4335 in a town name into collection search. Or you can, or in addition, you should go to the online indexes through the quick links box on the homepage. Click on A for architecture and design. Click on search the index and then type in the town name. Some of these plans are digitised and available to view online, but not all of the plans are listed online. So if you're looking for a particular government building and can't find it on our website in one of those two places, again, use the Ask an Archivist form on our website. Theatres and public halls, again, cover a huge range of um, times, 1895 to 1992. These are not public buildings, these are private buildings. And the reason we hold records is because they had to be licensed. The licensing and regulations are basically related to public safety, owned by a whole gamut of people, private individuals, businesses, religious organisations, community groups and councils, and used for every sort of imaginable purpose. They provide lots of information about local businesses, both in relation to the theatres and public halls, because quite often they were owned locally and certainly run locally and the building industry as well. You'll also see police and fire brigades playing a role in inspections. These theatres and public halls are a large part of recreation in any town and the rise and fall of these buildings chart changes in population and the broader world of recreation. And if you go in and search them, you'll see the quantity that were licensed through time. So now Emily's going to take you behind the scenes to look at one of these files and the file that she's featuring is for the Capitol Theatre in Wagga. Here today what we've got is the file for the Capitol Theatre in Wagga. This file starts in 1929 when they were thinking about building the theatre and it carries all the way up to 1966 when they were thinking of pulling it down to put a coals over the top of it. A proposal to build an A-grade theatre at Wagga. It's talking about the location of the site and why it's such a good site um, and also the plans for what they intended to build on the site. So they were looking at that stage at, to accommodate up to 1500 people um, and saying that the site faced Gurwood Street. The police have been asked to provide a report. They're inspecting public premises as well, so another evidence of other work that they did. Um, here we've got more of a fire inspection, looking at the different appliances. 
and where they were. Here we go, we've got blueprints of the heating arrangements. Then here we've got details about how often they could show pictures here. So every night from sun Monday to Saturday and a matinee twice a week um, and no other uses for the licensed premises in question. So it was just to be used for the movies really, this one. We've got some lovely letterheads going through. And one interesting thing that happens with these, some of these theatres and public halls start off as individual halls or theatres that over time were taken over and became part of a chain that might be through one particular area. Here is the plan of the Capital Centre. The lounge seats and the dress circle seats. The boxes. And a stage. Some of these theatres would have been used for schools and other organisations as well. Sometimes public halls were actually used to house, cl house classrooms as towns expanded. Um, and so you can see some evidence of that. Um, here we've got a letter informing the authorities that the, the name was going to change from JK Capital Theatres to Hoyt's Country Theatres Proprietary Limited. So and the file continues onwards to 1965, 1966, and at that time the theatre was closed down as it was sold in 1965 by Hoyts, which we can see here uh, was GJ Coles and they were going to build a supermarket at that location. So there are some extracts from that um, file about the Capitol Theatre at Wagga on the Wagga Archives in Your Town page. But I'm going to talk about the Masonic Hall on Tarkata Street near Johnson Street. Um, quite an old public hall. It was inspected for sanitary purposes in 1926 and you can see the sort of information that they're providing. It's a two-storey brick building, upper portion used as the lodge rooms, has an iron coved ceiling and wooden floors, maintenance good, ventilation's good, had a capacity of 500 people and was used for general purposes, chiefly dancing, and about once a week. And you're pleased to know the cleanliness was good. So here's a plan it's undated, but looking at where it comes in the file, it's probably from about the 1930s. So Tarkata Street down here, there's a lane up the side. This is the Masonic Temple with its separate entrance and then an entrance through here into the actual hall. Exex, the exits um, went out onto private land where there was a private dwelling. And fairly typically there's Run typically, there's dressing rooms at the front, there is a stage, and then there's an exit out the back to where the WCs are and a gate out into the lane. The plan is of alterations and extensions in the mid 1960s, and then on the right, you can see the standard report produced to the regular inspections carried out by the local police, which is another way to find out what the police were doing and who the police was. Police in the town at the time. Um, so there's six fire buckets. Um, the water supply is through the town water supply. Um, it's considered substantial for public entertainment, um, that there are alterations completed as you can see. Exit lights provided, ground floor seats for and the first floor seats 80. So you can see that in the alterations, they've put in an upper hall and added quite a bit of, so there's a meeting room and a kitchen, which I don't think was there before. 
So how do you find the theatres and public halls files? Go to our website records.nsw.gov.au, just type in the series NRS 15318 and a town name. All of the files that we hold are listed online, none of the files are digitised though, so you would need to come to the reading room to see those. Are the bankruptcy files, NRS 13658 covering 1888-1929. So there's a definition of what bankruptcy is, but the thing that I wanted to draw to people's attention is that the bankruptcy file contained list of creditors that the bankrupt person owed money to and the debtors that owed money to the bankrupt person. And through these lists, they show the commercial connections in a town, between towns and with Sydney. The bankrupt person also provides a statement about why they became bankrupt, often providing a picture of what's happening in the town and beyond. And then the files of the bankrupt people in a town collectively show what sorts of businesses were operating, but also admittedly what sort of businesses were not operating quite so well. So Emily is going to take you behind the scenes to have a look at what you might find in a bankruptcy file. So we hold quite a good collection of bankruptcy files. They cover from 1888 up to 1928. This particular file I've got in front of me is for a man called Elijah Alexander, who went bankrupt in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So the files contain a lot of repetitive material because at the base it's really about how much money was owed by the bankrupt and how much money could they get back from their creditors and give their debtors. Okay, so usually there's a statement on the file to where the bankrupt gets a chance to explain what led up to their current unfortunate situation. So he says he was recently the licensee of the Freemasons Hotel at Broken Hill and he's the bankrupt. He filed a statement of his affairs with the registrar in Sydney and he goes through a list of creditors that owe him money. He says he was insolvent previously in 1881. He attributes his bankruptcy to sickness in the family and the drought in 1891-92 um, and the Broken Hill strikes by which his house was boycotted and also losses on a contract to provide food for free labourers on the mines during the strikes. Um, he had three partners and he, he and his partners lost £670 by a contract Due to a range of issues with the partnership, he took possession of the hotel in 1891. Um, he gave the company £1,036 in cash and then proceeded to spend quite a bit of money on the hotel. Had to value all the furniture and effects in the hotel. He says he's been out of employment since the whole thing started. And we do remember too that in 1891 there was also a depression so I'm sure that did not help matters at all. So here we've got a lot of creditors unsecured um, and the kinds of people who were creditors were brewers and merchants and wine merchants, tea merchants, chaff merchants. We've got debts to the estate. Some of these people I th or possibly most of these people might be people who just owed the hotel money for drinking debts perhaps. Uh, so there's quite a people working at the proprietary mine who all owed like one and two pounds, three pounds sometimes. Here we have a list of goods that were bought of Alex Marshall, the wholesale and family butcher in Broken Hill, prime beef. And looking through it, we notice that there's a lot of cooked beef, there's mutton, there's raw beef, mints giving us an idea of what people ate when they went to the hotel in Broken Hill in the 1890s.
So in this list from this wholesale and retail cash grocer, Huskisson & Co, we've also got food, so things like raisins and vinegar, uh, thyme, flour, rice, oatmeal, quarter of a tonne of sugar, would you believe, sago, turmeric, allspice, currants, lots of proofs of debt from various creditors and the sorts of things. Um, as we just saw, the invoices from and the letterheads from the creditors can be quite beautiful pieces of art in themselves. The names of everyone who's got a bankruptcy file in this period are listed in our online indexes and in our catalogue. So you can search for the name and the location of the person. So let's look at someone who became bankrupt in Wagga. So Thomas Roy Moon was a dairyman in Wagga. He was declared bankrupt on the 22nd of August in 1898. He'd been carrying out the business of a dairyman for about 18 months. So as part of a bankruptcy, there's usually a public hearing and there's a set series of questions and these are some of Thomas Milne's answers to them. So when they asked about his trade or occupation, he says a general labourer. Um, do you, have you kept books of account? Not kept books of account for the last two years. The cause of his bankruptcy, he lists as bad seasons, loss in stock and not sufficient employment. He commenced um, business in September 1881, even though he says elsewhere within the file, um, that he's basically been a dairyman for about 18 months. He had 80 pounds capital at the beginning and he's got no money at the bankers at the moment. He's kept no accounts. He thinks he took in about 50 pounds per annum during his time and his expenditure was about 50 pounds per annum. This is the list of Thomas Milne's unsecured creditors and see again, it shows you the sorts of dealings that he's having. So he's dealing with a farmer in Euroquinity, the sheep purchased. He's dealing with a butcher in Wagga and where it says judgment debts and cost, there's some people, Clark was one of them, who took um, court action against him prior to his bankruptcy. And agents in Sydney, uh, someone in Coolerman, I thought this was a little bit sad. So the Reverend from St John's Presbytery has obviously accepted a £12 promissory note from Thomas Milne to, I guess, provide possibly a little bit of charity. He owes money for a subscription to newspaper in Wagga and owes money to agents in Wagga for a horse that he's purchased. He did have some assets. He owned a property at Juni which was mortgaged and he had house, household goods valued at about £20. The 1890s, as Emily said, were a time of depression across Australia, possibly the most severe depression that Australia's ever seen. Thomas Milne's bankruptcy was discharged in 1908, and this is some of his statements from the discharge process. So it's 10 years later, but you can see from his answers that it's still really quite raw. Um, had no occasion to keep any books as I was working principally for wages, as I was only carrying on the business of a dairyman for about 18 months. Kept a dairy, showing what milk I'd supplied to my customers each day, um, but was informed by the district registrar that that wasn't adequate. Um, I had not many customers as owing to the bad season, I was unable to supply many. I lost cattle and incurred expense in keeping others alive, continued to carry on business in the hope that the season would change and that I would then be able to pay my debts. Um, the majority of the cows which I was milking were the property of Lewis Morant, who also owned the land on which I was carrying on the business and I had to keep them alive and let my own cows die. If you want to find the bankruptcy files, go to our website, click on online indexes in the quick links box B for bankruptcy, and then click on bankruptcy and solvency in the list of topics. So you can either choose bankruptcy 1888 to 1929, or the earlier is somewhat similar sort of process, insolvency 1842 to 1887.
and search the index. Now you can search by a person's name, but you can also search by a town. All of the files that we hold are listed in the index, but none of the files are digitised other than the six files that we've digitised for archives in your town. Deceased estate files. These were files put together between 1880 and 1958 to decide whether or not death duty would be charged on a person's estate. So they're basically a financial record of the person's estate when they die. Martin is going to take you behind the scenes this time. Hi everyone and welcome to this next instalment of our Archives Behind the Scenes videos from New South Wales State Archives. We're in cell 10, uh, the famous green cell, not only because it has a green floor and green shelves, but even green labels on all of the boxes that are in here as well. One of the highlights of the State Archives collection that are held in this cell are around 7,000 boxes of deceased estate files from the Stamp Duties Office. These are files that were created when death duty was payable in New South Wales. The series of files dates from 1880 through to the late 1950s, and they are a financial record of someone's estate when they died. So in order to establish how much death duty was payable on an estate, that estate had to be valued in some way. And in order to provide that value, you had to list out and enumerate all of someone's real estate, their personal belongings, and their other personal estate. And that's exactly what these deceased estate files are. They're a financial record, but a real treasure trove of information. Now you can access indexes to the deceased estate files on our website and also on the websites of our partners, Ancestry and Find My Past. So between those three websites, and our website address is www.records.nsw.gov.au, you should be able to find an entry for anyone that you might be interested in, in the deceased estate files. Anyway, what sort of information do they show? Come a little bit closer and I'll show you an example of one of the files. So this is the file for John Henry Williams, who dies in Sydney in Randwick in 1945. His file typically comprises an overall value of his estate and then the paperwork to do with the administration of his estate and that whole process of enumerating the estate. So page upon page of details of this person's estate. What's really interesting about this example, and it's by no means an unusual example, is the wonderful listing of all of the personal estate that was contained when John Henry Williams died in 1945. So you'll see listings here of furniture, of cushions, of curtains, of glassware, and a value for each item. Because that's exactly what these files are, remember, is a financial record of someone's estate. So they're a wonderful source of information because they tell you how someone was living at the time of their death and what objects, what estate, what real estate, what personal estate they left when they died. Bye for now. There are deceased estate files for people from all walks of life, men and women, all ages and financial positions. The deceased estate files and the probate packets that we'll look at next cover the wrap up of a person's estate when they die. The probate packet shows what happens to the estate, who inherits, whereas the deceased estate files, as I said, are about calculating death duty. There's an overlap between the two series, but it's always worth looking at both if there are both. Both series provide great information about a person and how they live their lives. Also provide a lot of information about the town the person lived in, what businesses there were, who knew who, who dealt with who, what sort of housing was there. These two deceased estate files from 1938 and 1908 are typical of people of their time and their roles. Both of these people have probate packets. So this is the deceased estate file from Eva Jane to Hudson, who was a hotel keeper, who died in 1938, aged 65 years. One of the executors of her will, Roy Tapscott, signed the affidavit. So these again, just extracts from this file. There were debts owed to the estate, which you can see on the left. Everything from an overdraft, there's a mortgage, professional fees, um, 
often they will be medical professional services, which you would expect all of these files are about people that have died. Um, there's a debt to tooth who provided goods to keep the pub going. There'll also be proof of debts and you can see on the right that's the basically the invoice from tooths saying how much Eva de Hudson owed. She'd owned the Southern Cross Hotel since 1920 and was licensee from 1975. And just a slight diversion, we have a great series of files about um, hotels and the people who owned them. It's NRS 9522 and there's a card on there for the Southern Cross Hotel and lots of others for lots of other Wagga hotels. And that's how I know that she owned it from 1920. Her estate was worth nearly £9,000. Now the majority of that estate, as you can see here from this schedule, was the hotel and the land. And she also owned a property in Sydney at Burwood. Um, it's a great description of the hotel, brick building, ground floor, two upper floors, known as the Southern Cross Hotel, 21 bedrooms, three parlours, a dining room, kitchen, storeroom, four bathrooms, one laundry, four lavatories. Need a painting, a bit of renovation. There was the galvanised shed. The other schedule is listed on the affidavit as plant. So glasses, water jug, cash register, the sorts of things that you would need to carry up the business in a hotel. Deceased estate files often provide hugely detailed lists and Eva de Hudson's file includes a list of everything, like as far as I can see, in a hotel in 1938. There were over 30 rooms, not counting the balconies. So this schedule, this is the stock she had in hand. Um, 76 bottles of lager, bitter ale and stout. Six bottles of mixed cordials, a two gallon jar of white port, a two, gallon, uh, two two gallon jars of white port and one gallon jar of dark port. Um, vermouth, sparkling hock, cider, lemonade, everything. And then these are just some of the bedrooms and the information about what they contain. It's fairly similar. And then the front balcony, obviously used as to house more people sleeping, much cheaper accommodation on the shore, four iron single beds, four sets of bedding and blankets, a wardrobe, curtain wardrobe, dressing table, um, a washstand, double iron bed, single iron bed, another wardrobe, and presumably to provide some privacy, a old canvas blind. So really literally a picture of, without a huge amount of descriptive information, but everything that was in the hotel at the time. The second person we're going to look at is Charles Hardy, contractor in Wagga Wagga who died in 1908. Now Charles Hardy worked as a builder and contractor in the Wagga area for over 30 years and basically has been said to have built Wagga. Two of his sons signed the affidavit. His estate was worth over 16,000 pounds and he had nearly 3,000 pounds of debts. And the debts you can see on the left, the bulk of it's uh, overdraft with the bank. Um, there's a few debts that are obviously within the family to C Hardy and Co Timberworks and to BE Hardy some money lent. But in comparison to the rest of his estate, he um, was obviously quite comfortable. A lot of the value in that estate was real estate. So there were nine lots of land in Wagga. Most of it was rented out. And so, and I've just, this is an extract of the pages. These pages alone provide a good look at Wagga in 1908. Who's living where and what rent are they paying? So there's a shop on Fitzmorris Street, it's let to Ross and Co, and that's the rental. Three shops let to Mr. Skerry with the yearly tenancy, shop let to Mr. McCuskey, yearly tenancy, shop let to Mr. Levitt, yearly tenancy, and a shop left to Mr. Macron, yearly tenancy. Um, the other lot four, same street, weatherboard cottage let to Mr. Porter, brick cottage let to Mr. William Clare. Fantastic information. Um, 
And then on the right is just two rooms of the furniture from what was obviously quite a substantial family home. They had a piano, got tapestry chairs, a hearth rug, curtains and rod, the fire irons, the scuttle, their ornaments. So this is quite a cosy house with them, um, you know, decorative touches. It also must have been quite intrusive for the family to have someone come in and basically go through the entire house valuing it. But it does give us an amazing picture inside people's homes in a way that there's probably no other way of getting it. Among Charles Hardy's other assets, which are life insurance policies, which is not unusual, but you know, very sensible of him, and then much less usually, a portion of surface gear of mining pump lying into an abandoned mine near Bar Medman. It's very old and it's worth five pounds. And whenever I see that, I just wonder who in the family thought to mention that? Or perhaps the people doing the valuing said, didn't he used to have a mine at Bar Medman? What about that? So deceased estate files, click on online indexes, D for deceased estate files, search the index. Now again, you can search by a person's name or if you want to look more broadly, search the town name. Our index covers 1880 to 1939, but the files cover 1880 to 1958. So for 1940 to 1958, try ancestry.com or find my past. We do a copy order service for these files and it covers $37.90. Now you do get wonderful ones like Eva de Hudson's, you might also get one which is literally four pages. It just depends on the person that you're researching. So probate packets again, a huge slab of New South Wales colonial history, 1817 to 1976. Not everyone has a probate packet, depending on the type, size and value of the assets located in the state. It may not be necessary to do that. And it's basically what it is, is getting authority by the Supreme Court to deal with the deceased person's state, estate. There's a lot of crossover in content between deceased estate files and probate packets, but it's in the probate packets generally that you'll find a will. Hi, and welcome to the latest instalment of Behind the Scenes here at New South Wales State Archives. I'm down here in what we call stage five of our facility, which is where we store one of our most popular record series the probate packets. Probate packets contain the last will and testament of the person who passed away, as well as other administrative documents around settling of the estate. And as you can see, we've got boxes and boxes of them. In fact, we hold probate from 1817 right up to 1976, as well as a bit of 1989. And the remaining packets are held by the New South Wales Supreme Court. So why are they called packets? Well, as you can see, the New South Wales Supreme Court used to store the documents in these envelopes. But they're pretty hard to get out sometimes. And in fact, I can't even get the records out of this one. So now that they're here at the archives, wherever possible, we try to move the records into these white archival envelopes. And they're much roomier and generally much better for the records. So what else can you find in a probate packet? Well, sometimes you can find birth and marriage certificates because people had to prove who they were in order to gain their inheritance, particularly women who may have married. And sometimes you find very unique artifacts in the probate packets. And one of my favorites I'm going to show you now. This is the last will and testament of Cecil Winch, who was a soldier who went off to World War I and unfortunately lost his life in Gallipoli. And he penned his will on the back of the family photo that he carried with him to war. And to me, it's just a poignant reminder of the death and grief that that generation suffered during a horrible time in our history. But don't just take my word for it. If you'd like to go looking for a probate packet for someone in your family, head over to our website, put their name in the search box on the home page, and don't forget to add the word death. If you have any trouble, have a look at the probate guide on our website under Research A to Z, or you're welcome to give us a call or drop us an email. Anyway, it's time for me to get back to work. And of course, the box I want is right up on the top shelf. It's lucky I'm not afraid of heights. See you next time.
these two probate packets are both from the 20th century and they're typical of people of their time and their roles, but they're also quite special because they're fairly significant people in Wagga's history. So the first one is for William John Monks, who was born in Wagga, and he lived in the pastoral hotel for part of his childhood. William Monks was an architect in Wagga, and over 40 years, he and his company designed buildings in practically every district in the southern half of the state. Monks and Hardy are a frequent combination in building Wagga Wagga. William Monks died in 1943 in Melbourne, where he'd gone for medical treatment. His estate was worth over 70 six thousand pounds. His estate passed to his sister, as you can see here in Exeter D, and his brother. His brother actually died two months afterwards, so that his share then passed on to um, William Monks's sister-in-law, Ida Elizabeth Monks. The estate included real estate, government stocks and mortgages. There are 11 parcels of land, as you can see on the right. Some was owned, owned outright and some with his sister and the brother who died shortly after him. There is more detail about the parcels of land. So um, there's pages of information about that. So this is one of the parcels of land on Baylor Street, Wagga. There's two semi-detached brick shops and a small residence with kitchen laundry and side veranda, it's got electric light, and that's the value of the land and the improvements. You can see that he still obviously maintained at a fairly mature age, um, an office in Wagga, and he had a small amount of his own furniture in the house that he shared with his sister. So basically just the furniture that was in his bedroom or some of the furniture that was in his bedroom. His treasury bonds, well, he had a successful career and he seems to have saved and used his money quite well. So he had 18,000 pounds of treasury bonds. There were also 37 pounds, 37,000 pounds, sorry, of mortgages. Small number of debts, mostly medical um, debts in relation to treatment in Melbourne and just a few other things. Moving into the 1970s, so remembering the probate packets grew up into the 70s, Eric Leslie Weasel was a depot superintendent who died in Wagga in 1972, age 69. How could I do Wagga and not talk about sport? So Eric Weasel is one of the many sports stars from Wagga. He played rugby league in the Riverina area and he was good enough to play for New South Wales and for his country without having to play for a Sydney rugby league club. This is his will in which he leaves everything to his wife Margaret. So you can see it's quite a simple straightforward will. Devise and bequeath the whole of my estate both real and personal of whatsoever nature and whatsoever wheresoever situate unto my wife the said Margaret Eileen Weasel subject to her surviving me for more than three months um, and then if not then to his children. So his signature and then these are the signatures on the right of the witnesses to his will. His estate was worth over £15,000. The bulk of that estate was for the family home in Ferreri Street. So it's a brick cottage, galvanised iron double garage, fencing, paving and ground improvements. So it's 1973 and car ownership is much more common. So his Cortina 1600 sedans worth um, $1,300. And the great thing is, wherever I've encountered a car in these files, they'll give the registration number. The time period shows too in the contents of the house. So there's the Philips TV, it's worth $70. And if you look at the comparison with other things in the house, that's an expensive part of the, um, and also a Meta's fridge worth 50 pounds. And you'll see that there's carpet, no lino, which is quite common in other deceased estate files. To find probate packets, just go to our website and either type the word death, because that appears in every file, or the series number NRS 13660 and a person's name into collection search. 
all of the files we hold are listed online. We achieved that this year and we're very happy about that. None of the files are digitised except for the ones that we've done for archives in your town, but you can do a copy order and that costs $53.80. Thank you for joining us to talk about Wagga Wagga and for your contributions, which have been just really fascinating. Make sure you have a look at the Wagga Wagga Archives in Your Town webpage. There's a link from the news box on our homepage.